Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, welcome. Welcome to the journey. Thank you for being in worship today. If you're a first time guest, so glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us. And if this is your church home. Welcome back. It's good to see so many of you here today. Friends, we are in the third week of a four week series called Happy. Yeah. You like that? You like that? Ha- There's a question mark. Happy? Um, I, I, I annoy the pastors when I make it sound like that. Happy? Because we do have to ask ourselves, what does happiness mean and look like in our lives? That word it can be kind of fleeting, like I'm happy about whatever. But like, what does it mean to find true happiness? And today we're looking at happiness beyond our circumstances, things we can't control. Uh, Miss Lauren gave just a little preview of that with our kids and fought through kind of her, her voice going out. She did a great job. And we're going to think about that a little bit more larger scale. Uh, and we have been doing that in this series because, you know, we were in Matthew's gospel for so long and it was wonderful. Uh, but the past three weeks, we've been kind of all over the place. Two weeks ago, we were in um, Ecclesiastes. Remember that, Pastor Jennifer? Then two week, uh, one week ago, we were in Genesis chapter 50, looking at the story of Joseph today, flip to the old New, Te- the old New Testament, flip to the New Testament, uh, and you'll find in uh, Paul's letters to the Philippians, uh, and we'll be in the fourth chapter. One of my favorite letters, Paul's writing to this church in Philippi, will be in the fourth chapter. We're going to read verses uh, four through seven, then 11 through 13, this little chunk. You may have heard these words before. I hope they are, they are not uh, new to you, but if they are, I hope it blesses you because there's a good word to be heard today, and we're going to look about uh, what Paul is saying to this church uh, in Philippi and to us today. So let's check it out together. If you got your Bibles, open up. Philippians is near the end of the Bible. If not, no worries. Words are right here on the screen. Let's jump in. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer, and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. This, my friends, is the word of God for us, the people of God. And together we all say, thanks be to God. Amen and amen. Many of y'all know from my personal testimony that I am a journalist dropout. It's true. I went to school for journalism. That was what I was passionate about. In a way, I still get to do some investigative journalism even today as I seek and look for the Spirit of God dwelling amongst this community and this world and then tell y'all about it. Uh, I was actually seeking to be a sports journalist, had an internship with the illustrious Shreveport Times, premier newspaper of the South. And uh, I had also an in with the Dallas Morning News upon graduation. And my hope is that that would propel me on to one day working for ESPN and being a journalist for them. But today I'm here and I give glory to God for that. Turns out that pastoring is a sport unto itself. I'll let you think about that as you will. So the NFL draft uh, this past week got me a little like hyped a little bit because it got my mind and like my interest perked a little bit. My, my journalistic inclinations picked up a bit. For those of you who don't know this happened, that's okay. Let me tell you a little bit about it. This week, NFL teams from around the country went and selected uh, their picks of the best college athletes to come and join their team. But it's not just uh, an on-the-field statistic sort of uh, um, show, like how many tackles you had or the person who has the most touchdowns thrown. These teams and coaches and personnel are looking at the whole person. They're looking at their person's, the player's IQ, their likability, their off-the-field attitude, their ability to represent the team and the city they get chosen to play for. 
And those stats matter when you are picking someone in especially the first round that's going to be, in a way, a face of the organization. Another aspect that teams are looking for is a player's proneness to injury. If someone hurt their knee at the beginning of the season and they ran a certain time in the 40-yard dash, and then after, at the end of the season, that time is slower than previously, well, that's something they're going to note. Recruitment at this level of sport is looking at every variable possible. But as I watched this year's draft with intent, I caught a line from one of the analysts that sort of shook me a little bit. Uh, The analyst was looking at players. Obviously, all of the analyzing that happens is speculation. No one knows how good a player is going to be until they actually get on the NFL football field. But as a specialist was rattling off all these stats about this player, one of the critiques or one of the comments he made about him was this, that this player was battle-tested with off-the-chart immunity. Battle-tested with off-the-chart immunity. I don't know about you, but when I think about immunity, I don't technically think about an NFL football player, right? Immunity is always something like I've equated to my body. It's why my parents stuffed me full with eating those Flintstone vitamins when I was a little kid, those little pieces of chalk that have grape flavor in them. You know what I'm talking about? Does that date me a little bit? Yeah. But I know it's, it's, it's more interesting than that. It's interesting that one of the great beauties and mysteries of life is how God has crafted and created and shaped the human body with the innate and instinctive ability to heal itself. The dictionary defines immunity as a state of being resistant to particular diseases or pathogens. I mean, think about it, friends. One of the great wisdoms, excuse me, wonders of our life is that under the right circumstances, your body will begin to heal itself. When you get a cut somewhere on your body, your body's immune system finds a way to utilize proteins and platelets to rush to the injury site to allow you to not fully bleed out or bleed to death. That's what the immune system does. Your body creates certain antibodies so that it doesn't have to use antibiotics to fight off different things, different diseases that come your way. Your body, get this, if you hear anything about all the science I just ripped off of you, get this, your body was created to heal itself. Now I acknowledge that that doesn't mean it happens every single time. There are things that our immune system can't immediately fight off that need specific aid and treatment. There are things out of your control. Now, I know I'm not a doctor. I hope one day I'm a reverend doctor. I'm going to school for that. And when I do become reverend doctor, I expect every one of you to call me by that. (laughs) No exceptions. Just kidding. But here's my diagnosis for today, you might hear. There are some practices of our own choosing that can compromise our God-given immunity. In other words, if our body is created by God to heal itself, then anything that attacks or weakens it must be the result of something that is contrary to God's purpose for us. Whether that is a bad diet or lethargic living or any kind of suppressant, depressant enhancement we put into our bodies, to drown out the things that are going around us. Any of that cannot be a part of God's plan for who we are. One of the greatest hindrances, one of the greatest enemies of our day to that immune system with so much statistic evidence, it's almost too rich to kind of take all in is not a drug you put in your body, not a drink you have, not even El Tiempo Queso with those puffy chips. You know the ones I'm talking about? One of the greatest enemies 
to your body's ability to heal itself is an invisible enemy called stress. Y'all need to know, y'all be surprised at how much stress, worry, anxiety puts upon our body. Tension and muscle aches, stress. Elevated blood pressure, stress. Heart problems and heartache, stress. Headache and problems sleeping at night, stress. No patience, fuse so short that it's ruining relationships with other people, stress. Depression, anxiety, stress. Me sharing this list with you, stress. <laughs> In fact, it's proven that stress can fertilize the growth of certain sicknesses within our bodies. And most of us live every single day with some level of stress. The American Journal on Psychology recently came out with a report that said 78% of Americans today wake up and are worried about something before 9 a.m. in the morning. And 67% of Americans say that they don't get a good night's sleep at night because, quote, they are worried about something going on. That's not even the worst stat. stat. The worst one is this for me, that 82% of doctor's appointments in 2022 were related to some sort of stress-related ailment. Woof. So I know this is something we don't normally do here at the journey, but I want you to do, take a second, turn to the neighbor next to you and say, you stress out too much. <laughs> do it. You stress out too much. You stress out too much. You stress out. Solidarity, friends. Doesn't it feel good? That's right. I'll charge you for this therapy session later. Yeah. Feels good. Now that we're all on the same page, I think to myself, how in the world did we get here? Like I look at my neighbor's son who just turned four years old. Big birthday party recently for little Joe. He's loving life. He's running in the front yard. He's like jumping, living carefree. And I'm like, oh man. And he's like, he doesn't worry about food coming onto his plate. If he were to open the fridge up four, he'd find plenty of things there. He wouldn't have to stress about there. He doesn't worry about bills. He doesn't worry about insurance or a mortgage. He's stressed about nothing. Sometimes I look at little kids that Miss Lauren's with and sure they've got stresses like sleeping in their grandmother's bed. <laughs> or things going on in life. But I'm like, that's the stress I want. Give me that, right? That, that I envy. I'm so jealous sometimes of little kids' lack of stress. I, I want to sing the old school Jeffrey the Giraffe song that comes into my mind. You might know it. I don't want to grow up because I'm a Toys R Us kid. Got so many different games I can play with from bikes to trains to video games. It's the greatest toy store there ever is. I don't want to grow up because if I did fill in the blank with me, friends, I wouldn't be a Toys R Us kid. Huh. Any of y'all wake up in the morning sometimes wishing you were just like Peter Pan? Or you could go to Never Never Land, <laughs> never grow up, never worry, never stress. Buy, some, buy a lot and Never Never Land, that'd be nice. Well, friends, hear this. Next time that you wake up at night and you are stressed, maybe it's more like in the morning, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and you're stressed, or the stress meets you whenever you're getting your cup of coffee, the next time your blood pressure is racing and rising because you know what awaits you around the corner, I want you to hear the words of the Apostle Paul today who looks at us and in verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. Be worried about nothing. Be stressed about nothing. Be upset about nothing. Here's a little Greek for y'all this morning. The word nothing, that's the translation in most of our Bibles today. But if you look at older translations, the translation turns into the word, the phrase, nobody. In other words, be anxious for no one. Be worried. Some of y'all need to hear this. Be worried over nobody. Or the MJV translation, Michael Jarbo version, you can get that here in stores, would say, don't let nobody get under your skin, right? Don't let nobody steal your joy. 
Don't let anybody put fear in your heart. Don't be anxious for anybody. But you know, I hear Paul say these words, be anxious for no one. And I don't know, Pastor DeAndre, I wonder what planet he's living on. What world does he live in? Because you see, my world, I got something to stress over every single day. There's always another unexpected bill I have to pay or an issue I got to handle or some mess slung across my social media stream or another person that just keeps barking their mouth. And every day there is something that I can be worried about. And yet Paul says, be anxious for nothing. And here's what I think is the heart of Paul's argument, why he's saying this, like what seems crazy to us today. He's saying, I think there's something fundamentally wrong when we trust in God, but we worry about things. There is something paradoxical about someone who trusts in God, but is anxious about everything in their life. Something doesn't add up. And so Paul gives the Philippians these things, this antidote to help them in their worry. And it's three things he says. He says, the first thing is do not be anxious for anything, but in every situation, pray. Prayer, pray. Prayer is critical in finding peace when your heart is so filled with worry. In fact, Paul puts it first on the list. Why? Because I think he knows what the human condition is all about. You know, see, we, we, we often loft up Paul to being like God-like sometimes, but he's a dude like all of us too. Paul knows the nature of the human being, knows our inclinations, knows our instincts. And he knows that my instinct is to worry about the thing. My instinct is to think that everything possibly could go wrong. My instinct is to add up all the pros and all the cons on a little post-it note and beep, 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 like which one's bigger, which one's more, and make a decision based on that. My instinct is flight or fight. Fight or flight, yeah. What Paul's saying is if you're rooted in Christ, your instinct ought to be pause and pray to work on your conversation piece with God to make your relationship with speaking with God more normalized. And when we, it is more normalized, we can tell. And when it's not, our, our, our prayer life kind of feels like text messaging somebody. A lot of times I'm like, hey God, do this. Hey God, figure this out. Hey God, fix this. Hey God, work this out for me. By the way, we good? We cool? Okay, cool. Thanks. Bye. See you later. Right? When our prayer list is just a laundry list instead of lingering in our presence, or better yet, when our prayer list begins to morph into, when our prayer life begins to morph just into our life in general, and we don't have a prayer life and a regular life, that's when we begin to witness our nature and our instincts beginning to change. It's a prayer. Second, Paul says, by prayer and petition. Petition. Some translations say supplication. That's a big word. That word basically just simply means to ask. Paul says, pray and ask for what you need. Pray and share the desires of your heart. Pray and give yourself and your needs to God. And that's good news. Because I would figure and I would say, that the majority of the people in your life, if you went to them and shared all the things going on, everything, you laid it all out there, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and then you laid, uh, said, oh, 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 by the way, also, I need this, 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 and this. Most of them would come back with a really rightful question. They would say, what's that got to do with me? I got my own troubles. I think that's why we have therapists, don't we, friends? You do have a therapist, don't you? I say there's two kinds of people in the world, those who have a therapist and those who need a therapist. 
you know which one of those you are. I was in, uh, I saw a woman at HEB the other day and she was wearing a t-shirt and the t-shirt said, it's okay to have Jesus and a therapist too. I like that. I was going to walk up to her in HEB and take a picture. And then the Lord said, that's creepy, Michael. Step away from the woman. (laughs) And I thank the Lord for doing just that. So I stepped away, but it's good to have a therapist. But Paul says, when you operate in the Lord, you begin to recognize that God delights in you sharing your needs. If you don't ask, you won't know. And here's the number one thing we got to do. We got to reject the need to get the answer we're expecting God to give us. And just lay before God our petitions Lay before our ask. God is big enough and God is able to care for every need that we lay before him. The final thing, do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request with God. Now hold up, hold up, hold up real real fast. (laughs) Our boy Paul's got this mixed up. It's supposed to be, we file our request, and if God complies, then we give God thanks, right? That's what it was. No, no, no. It says, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known. It all starts with gratitude. I'd make this observation in my 10, almost 10 years of being a minister here at this church and in, 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 in my life. One thing I've noticed is it's impossible to be anxious and be grateful at the same time. It's impossible to be anxious and grateful at the same time because we get this tunnel vision, don't we? And all we see is what we can see outside of our tunnel vision. Like when we turn our head, it's like everything that stresses us out, but Thanksgiving breaks the tunnel down and says we can see the grander picture of what God is doing in our lives. We can say, yes, I am stressed about this thing. Yes, this woman is ruining my life at work. Yes, that person keeps coming back to church and I have to see them. Yes, this neighborhood. Uh, yes, yes, yes. But when we open up ourselves with gratitude and thanksgiving, we can see, oh, but God is still doing something big. God is still up to work in our world. And I know that's easier to say than to actually do, friends. And maybe you're thinking, hey, Jarbo, I'm with you. But sometimes it's just so rough. Giving thanks to God is difficult because I can't envision the finish line yet. If I can't see the thing, I can't be thankful for the thing. Jesus, in Matthew's gospel, Around chapter six, it's an area called the Sermon on the Mount. And he, uh, he does this weird thing. He invites the crowd to be less anxious by doing something strange. So I'm going to do something strange in the sermon. I'm going to read from the Bible. Um, I want to read Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34 to you. Just listen to these words. Listen to the advice that Jesus gave, gives the disciples and you today. Therefore, I tell you, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? I mean, look at the birds of the air. They do not reap or sow or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? This is Jesus, by the way, saying this. And why do you worry about clothes? I mean, see how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor will dress like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So do not worry asking, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself each day. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Notice how God, through Christ, 
tells us to point out the simple blessings all around us in our world. Partially, we've gotten bad at that as followers of Christ in 2023. And maybe that's why there's so much anxiety in your life. What's the small thing? Start there that you can give thanks for today. Begin to turn your heart towards gratitude. Because when we do all these things, prayer, petition, thanksgiving, when it becomes habitual, when it becomes natural, then we find the thing that we're all seeking, which is peace. Verse seven is one of my favorite in all of Bible. It says this, and the peace of God, which transcends, some of your translations say, passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's be honest, friends. We are all battle tested in this room in our own way. You know what battles you've been through. Every one of us. But let me just ask you this. How's your immunity? Is it off the chart or is it off the deep end? God gifts each and every one of us a bodily immune system, but I also think that God gifts each of us an immune system for our souls. So how's it doing? The more we pray and petition, the more we give thanks, the more we will be able to heal. May it be so. Amen. Let's pray together. Good and holy God, prayer, petition, thanksgiving. Prayer, petition, thanksgiving. These are the antidotes your disciple Paul gives us for the stresses of our life, the days that we worry, the times that anxiety fills our soul. And the percentage points out there don't look good in our favor. So help us, oh God, to put these practices into play. We don't have to hit home runs or throw touchdowns every time we do. Just put the ball in play. Just give us, God, the space to try this day and every day to be a little bit more like you, to offer our prayers and petitions and thanksgiving up holy. Lord, it's a lot of work, but we know with your help, we can do all things through you who strengthens us. Praise things in Christ's holy name. Amen.